Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. We're going to start a new book today, the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel in the Hebrew tongue means, my God is El, but I would prefer to translate it, El strengthens me, or God, our Father, strengthens us. If you want to know where strength comes from, that's what the word Ezekiel means, is God will strengthen you. As a matter of fact, there are many things that can strengthen you for a short period of time. God will strengthen you forever, even for the eternity, if you come into his territory, into his uh, wonderful house. Uh, Ezekiel uh, took place about 484 B.C. You might take note of that, um, and, and it, this is with the 110-year correction that you will find in your companion Bibles in the chronological chart, but, and that, that would be the actual time. Uh, he was sent during the captivity, but God saw that you will find more concerning the millennium in this book of Ezekiel than you will in all of the New Testament put together. So it's very rewarding in that it informs us. And Ezekiel is the book that God saw fit himself, not just the Holy Spirit, not the Son of God, but God Himself came, visited us, gave us a direct message in this book of Ezekiel. I mean, even brought the very altar of God with Him. That's pretty impressive when you stop and think about it. Why did He do that? To strengthen us, to give us hope, whereby we see that that He provides for us and how precious it is. Ezekiel's reign will last about 21 years. That's three times seven, spiritual completeness. Uh, three sevens being 21. And what a fascinating book. Let's go with it. Chapter 1, verse 1, the great book of Ezekiel, God strengthens us. Verse 1 reads, Now it came to pass in the 30th year of the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kivar, that means a length, like a length of time, you might take it. That the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. I mean, he saw him directly. That, that is so very unusual. But uh, verse 2, In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. Now, many people get Jehoiakim mixed up with jo Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was the, was the offspring. He would be later, his name would be changed, as you will remember, to Jeconiah. And then when he was so disloyal to Almighty God, they would take away God's name and they simply call him Coniah, which is to say whom Yah has appointed. They would take the Yah away and just simply say appointed because he was appointed to something other than leadership. Uh, but his reign was only three months, so it was pretty short-lived anyway. Yeah, but that's what it's dated from, and that confuses some people because this would be C-H-I-N, and they confuse it with K-I-M being the final letters of Jehoiakim rather than Ken. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly, I mean just especially, unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Bazai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Kebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And, I mean, in person. That, what an what awesome thing. You know, people talk about, like, I talked to God today, uh-uh. You never forget, when God speaks to you, it's not something you just frivolously pass off. You may pray, but when God appears and touches it's an awesome, awesome experience. Verse 4, And I looked, listen carefully, I looked, what did he see? And behold, a whirlwind 
came out of the north a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness about it. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Now, um, this was a vehicle you're going to find out. And we're going to have to do a little bit of translating with this. You with the Strong's Concordances, I want you to document what I say. The word color, there's no such word in the Hebrew language as color. The word in the manuscripts is ayan, which is, looks much like our O, but it means the eye. It means you see. This is what I see. But now the color amber, that, that won't cut it. In other words, it almost takes away the real truth of color, like if you see something amber, if it was the Shekinah glory alone, you may not see anything, but there was an actual object here. Not just amber, it was an object. I want to call the word up in Hebrew for you on the screen. In your Strong's Concordance, it's the word 2830. It's kashmal, okay, kashmel, of uncertain derivation, uh, derivation rather, probably bronze or polished spectrum metal. In other words, it was highly polished bronze. It was translated as amber. That just doesn't cut it. I mean, he saw a vehicle. It was whirling, and it was highly polished bronze. The Shekinah glory shining off of it. What an awesome experience. Now, here you've got Ezekiel who's probably never seen a wheel other than on a cart, an ox cart or a, a camel cart. And those wheels roll right along on the ground. Well, now he's seeing wheels here that are in the air. They're flying. And they're highly polished bronze. Do you see what the difference, do you see how much difference this makes that you're not just seeing a vision of color? There's an object there and it's highly polished bronze. Verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. These are the zoi, okay, the same zoon that you find in the New Testament. What do they do? They guard the altar of God. They're the cherubims. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. In other words, they had the shape of a man. What, what, what is cherub in the Hebrew tongue? It's K-R-B. And even in English, KRB is keep and grab and grasp and guard. This, this was their duty. Anywhere they are, the altar of God is. So let that take away any doubt you might have that the physical actual ark of God was in this vehicle, this highly polished bronze vehicle, because the guards thereof were also present. Verse 6, And everyone... Each of these four, every one of these faces had every and and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. Now, don't, understand. Here we have a man that sees this highly polished object. It's flying. Every, everything he ever has ever known that flies has got to have a wing. Okay. So it's up there, and he's calling them wings. Verse 7, and their feet were straight, that means unjointed feet, and the sole of their feet were like unto the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of varnished brass. Why? Because they were varnished brass. Well, what was this that let down and they landed on it? It was their landing gear. You know, it's real easy for us to visualize that today. It was difficult for them at that time. A straight leg with a pad on the end of it, like a hoof, to set down and naturally support the vehicle. No problem there. All you have to do is add a few years to what we know today. And through the eyes of Ezekiel, I think he did a fantastic job of describing this appearance of the living God. Verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. 
Now, this, this is going to sound a little strange to you, but hang on. Hang on for a moment. Verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. They were in perfect formation as they flew. Now, they looked not where they went. Again, have you ever ridden a horse, a donkey, an ox? Where you go, you're going to turn the head of the animal, and it's going to look where you're going, and you're going to turn that. These things didn't have a head. They didn't have to look where they went. They just simply went where they wanted to. Why? They were perfectly a perfect circle. And he did a fantastic job of pulling that straight so that you could see an imperfect formation. As, as they moved, uh, I, again, for this to be 484 B.C., I think Ezekiel did a fantastic job delivering the description of this appearance. Next verse, please. Verse um, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion, on the right side, they had four. They four had the, the face of an ox. And on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Now, if you know anything about the nation Israel, you know this is God's way of saying, I've come to talk to my people Israel. Because this is the actual formation of the nation Israel in the habitation in which God placed them. To the north, Dan is the eagle. And to the east is the lion of Judah. This is where the, tri the way the tribes protected each other at encampment. And to the south was a man which was the tribe Reuben. And to the west, of course, was an ox, and that was always Ephraim. So there's no big deal in that. If you, if you want biblical proof, read the second chapter of, of uh, read Numbers chapter 2, verse 10, and, and forward, and you'll you see that where God lets you know what these faces mean, what these people mean in their encampment and in their privilege. So here we see the very zoon or the representatives of the house of Israel. You know, many people, always to the east was Judah. This is one of the reasons that I could translate the Bat Creek Stone so easily. Because in the first string of letters, at the beginning of the string of letters, I should say, was a resh, which rather than pointing west, pointed east, which if you put yourself in the position of those that wrote it, which were priests buried there, you have to think as a priest. So, Elif, Resh Elif, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And any, any scholar knows that. So, it made it quite easy to pick up and begin translating the string of letters in the Bat Creek Stone. Perfect Hebrew. Okay, so here you have the, the description, and you recognize the fact that God is coming to His people. His message will be for everyone, because through this people comes Christ, to whomsoever of whatever race, nationality, or language can have salvation. Verse 11, Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies, and they were enfolded. You know, they don't use, uh, we, we use um, fossil fuel to propel most any aircraft or thing that flies that we have today. And I assure you, this vehicle does not use um, fossil fuel. It has energy cells that are so very bright and that they teem within with power and might, with, and here to add to it the Shekinah glory. What, what does Shekinah mean? It means that God is there. Therefore, we see the beauty and the very bow itself of the prism of colors around our Heavenly Father. Verse 12, 
And they went every one straight forward. They, they were in formation. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. In other words, they didn't look where they, they just kind of went all together in formation. And where the vehicle went, those people went also. Well, now, wouldn't it stop and think? If you're in a car and the car turns, the people better turn too, or you got a problem. If you're in an airplane and the airplane turns, the people better turn with it. That's the spirits, okay? Verse 13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, these four zoom, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. This is the Zoe and of course the presence of God and the Shekinah glory. It's, it, 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 the light is amazing. That Shekinah glory that lets you know the presence of God. Awesome. 14. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. They were quick. Zoom, zoom. 15. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. I saw one of them actually come to earth. It landed. 16. The appearance of the wheels and their work was likened to the color of beryl. That's, that's to say sapphire. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He, he, like I said again, the only wheel he ever saw up to this time was on an, an ox cart, and it went by your side. These did not go by their side. They were flying and they were off the ground, and it would appear to him there was a wheel in a wheel because of the huge circular movement uh, of this vehicle. You might say, well, I wonder why God had to have a vehicle. His throne is there, his altar. It needs transportation, if, and um, the Spirit of God can go anywhere, but God is here in person to Ezekiel to deliver a message to you, especially in these end times especially because in this book of Ezekiel and the message he delivers covers more concerning the millennium, which you're going to have a great deal to do with, than any other book in the Bible. Father wanted you to know. So he came himself to see that this message was delivered properly. Next verse, please. 17. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. Again, having explained that, you understand. It's very difficult if you're used to seeing an old horse up in front of you looking to see where you go, to just see something circular just moving whichever object it wants, never being able to tell which way it's going to go. That amazed him. 18. As for their rings, the outer ring, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes. There were windows in them. There were portholes there. Round about them, four. All four of them had windows that I could see inside. 19. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up because the wheels were lifting the creatures and the creatures was, were in them and they moved and he could see through the windows, he could see them. <clears throat> it's no different than you looking in the window of an aircraft when it's taxiing or taking off or if you fly along beside one. Wherever that airplane goes, those people are going to go. <laughs> There's no big deal about that. Verse 20. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Meaning, being in them, naturally it moved with them. 
I, I, you know, I think, again, we have a little bit of repetition in this, but you've got a man here in 484 B.C. painting you a picture today when you have all this vast knowledge of aircraft and, and missiles and uh, satellites and so on and so forth uh, in this great generation that we live in where many of these things, many of us have seen all these things come into being in, in, in one lifetime. But back then, to see him describe in such detail what was actually happening, I think is fantastic. Let's go with the next verse, please. 21. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Again, declaring that. And, um, and so it is. We're... Where it goes, they go. Why? It was in perfect formation. And do you know what? Do you know why you see such perfect formation? Discipline. God in control. Everything works smoothly and right to the detail. But why? Because God is giving the instructions. God is giving the orders. 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of terrible crystal. Uh, you, you know, um, this word terrible should be translated reverence, okay? Um, reverence, uh, crystal. I mean, it was beautiful. Awesome to look at is what it really means. Stretch forth over their heads above. Why? Because the Shekinah glory of the living God was present. Verse 23, and under the firmament were their wings straight. They were level. The one toward the other, every one had two, which covered on this side, and every one had two, which covered on that side their bodies. And he's describing this. They were moving. Uh, you know, to him, if it's flying, it's got to be a wing. All right, you can understand that. 24, and when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings, they let down their landing gear, they settled. You know, the voice of the living God is awesome. And he comes again, as I stated, for a message to you today that you can see and understand and, and enjoy the very presence of God for telling us what is to come. For you can then understand better why Christ would say in Mark 13, hey, behold, I've foretold you all things and a lot of it is told right in this book, whereby you do not have to wonder, well, are, are there unidentified objects flying? Are there unidentified flying vessels? No, God knows what they are. They know what they are. We just don't, unless you're familiar with God's Word. Then you can kind of piece it together, and truth on truth, and understanding on understanding, well, then would all vehicles uh, be uh, friendly? No. You know the false Christ is coming back. It's, a, it's just like a car. It's according to who's driving it. That, that's really difficult to understand, is it not? No, it isn't. It's quite simple. We know the false Messiah comes first. He, doesn't, he, he may s assume he has an altar, but he doesn't. But he'll make a lot of people think he does. And he will also have to have transportation. Get used to it. Don't make a religion out of it, but understand the Word of God. You do believe God's Word, do you not? Verse 25, to continue. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood, 
and had let down their wings. In other words, they had landed, 26, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who, who was, it was be your father. He didn't send someone. He came himself to bring you a message, to bring you the truth, whereby you didn't have to wonder about what tomorrow brings and all these stories about these objects and so on and so forth to give you clarity and understanding and maturity. And most of all, common sense to understand the Word of God and the prophecies and advents spoken of in this Word of God. He came Himself. You know why? Because He loves you. He wanted you to receive the message. Verse 27, And I saw as the color of amber, there you go again, was the, what was this color amber? Highly polished bronze. As the appearance of fire round about within, within it, from the appearance of His loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it, the Shekinah glory. You know, if you, if, if when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Have you never read Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16? The appearance of Christ? It's the same thing. Described basically the same that brilliant, that glory, that wonderment of seeing the Savior and the Father in, that, in the presence of, with that, with that glory, and I'll repeat it again, Shekinah glory. And again, let me remind you again, what does the word Shekinah mean? A lot of people want to make a religion out of it. It just simply means God is there. So when God is there, you've got that Shekinah glory. You can count on it. It's always there. And how precious it is that our Father loves us enough. He strengthens us enough that He came Himself to prepare us for what is ahead. With this great prophecy in this book of Ezekiel, El strengthens, our Father strengthens us with truth, and, and uh, with the destiny to fulfill our obligation to our Father in loving Him and carrying out His commands. Verse 28 to complete the chapter. As the appearance, as the appearance of the bow, that, that means the prism of light that is around a rainbow. Have you ever seen one? Of course you have. That beautiful, anytime you see the, God's uh, altar and you see the presence of God, just as it is written in the fourth chapter of the great book of Revelation, you see that bow. As a matter of fact, I'll even go further yet. In chapter 5, you see the Antichrist riding on a white horse appearing, and he's got a bow, but it's a cheap fabric imitation. The word in the Greek is toxon. But here's the real thing. It's your father your Father that strengthens you and the beauty of the encirclement of light, that prism of light, the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. Looks just like that. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. It floored him. Now, God never talks to anybody when they're on their face. What he's about to do is to say, get up from there. You know, God doesn't particularly care for wimps. And it's understandable. The presence of God will knock you down. But you better get back up. And it's just like when God spoke to Job in Ezekiel chapter, um, Job chapter 38. He said, get up from there, gird yourself, and act like a man. And so it is. God loves men and women that serve Him. 
that face him, that love him. But here, here we have this one, and, and understandably so. I mean, he's right in the presence. But what then happens? Well, let's go just a little bit into chapter 2 here, and let's find out. What is the message? Verse 1, chapter 2, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. He won't speak to you until you do. Stand up and act like a man or a woman or a child of God. Verse 2, And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. Here comes part of the message. There's going to be a lot of it. Leadership. Direction. Verse 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Therefore you have the four faces in the explanation as I explain the encampment of Israel. To a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day, and I will add until this day. And God sends this same message, meaning get your act together. God has given us the truth. He speaks the truth, and the message is coming. And it is as timely today as it was in 484 B.C. when God delivered it to Ezekiel, God strengthens us. It will strengthen you today because the message that he brings is written to those children. And what he's, what he's about to say, they probably won't listen to you, but you're going to deliver it anyway. Verse 4, And they, all, and they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. They're stiff-necked. They won't listen. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And so it is. No excuses, no ifs, no ands. God is saying this is the way it's going to be. Now, I don't know. Do you believe the Word of God? Then don't miss the next lecture. Let's see what he has to say. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it with us. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. God is the judge and God alone, and that right is His. You do have the right to practice spiritual discernment. That is to say, who you should listen to and who you should not listen to, who you should fellowship with and who you should not fellowship with. Well, how would you know that? Well, it's a gift from God, a spiritual discernment. You know, God gives this to most people if they love Him, and your first opinion form usually is the correct one and um, again being a gift from God spiritual discernment leave judgment to our Heavenly Father 
Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need a number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. He knows what you're thinking. Why? Because He loves you. He may not love what you do all the time. But he does love you. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Fingerprints different. You're unique because he wanted someone just like you. But he does want that love return. Or guess what? That's what this earth age is all about, is dividing the shaft from the wheat. How are you doing? Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct. Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Scott from Maine. I am concerned about the rapture theory as our church preaches this, and I am torn between what the scriptures say and what this church preaches. Please advise me as a, to a specific scripture to read regarding this issue. Uh, I, I never tell anybody where they should go to church. I, I believe what I teach, that God's in control. God sends His elect wherever they need to be, and it could be in a church because they're going to plant a seed way down the road. However, when you know better and you support a church that teaches falsely, you're in a heap of hurt. Re uh, uh, scripture. You want Scripture? The second epistle of John states very clearly if you know that someone teaches a doctrine other than what Christ's Word teaches and you as much as wish them Godspeed, much less support them, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. So that's a pretty heavy trip if you know better. If you don't know any better, have a good trip. Way to go. But um, we never, I mean, God has to decide for a person where they should be. I believe that with all my heart that God intercedes in the lives of the elects and sends them wherever He would choose, where there's a need. Uh, Pastor Murray, Mary from Missouri, could you tell me what chapter in the Bible does it say we are supposed to forgive 70 times 70? No, it's 7 times 70, okay? What should we do if a friend is being mean to you? Are we still supposed to forgive or stand up for our Christian rights? Why, why, would you want to, why would you want to be around somebody that's mean to you? Tell them to shove off. Okay? You, don't, you don't need that kind of treatment. Life is too short to put up with junk. And somebody that would continue to mistreat you is um, you only forgive somebody when they repent for having offended you. If, if somebody abuses you and you forgive them and then they abuse you again, then your elevator is not topping out real good, okay? Uh, let me tell you how God says, even if it's a relative, to deal with them. And, and basically, it would be a, a brother or a sister, a relative. The way you would deal with them, you will find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, begin reading about verse 6. Uh, don't, you know... We are mature Christians, and Christians are first-class citizens, not second-class. We don't take nothing off nobody. Okay. We, we, have so, we live in a generation where, well, brother, you don't understand. That's, that's not politically correct. I could give two hoots whether it's politically correct. If it's moral correct, I'll go with it. If it's so-called politically correct, throw it out the window. Do you think I'm going to let one person come into this organization and say, it offends me when you mention Christ. I would say, push off. Get out of here. We don't need you. Go somewhere else where they're anti-Christian and go to hell. That's where it's going to be. You, you know, we don't put up with junk. That's just a little pastoral um, advice here in the middle of questions and answers, all right? For wh whoever needed it, somebody did. Maxine from Minnesota. Is it true that we, when we die, our soul goes back to the Father. Where can I find it in the Bible? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Instantly, when you're, the silver cord parts, meaning you kick the bucket, okay, 
your soul, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, returns to the Father that gave it, and this flesh goes back to dirt, and it stays there, okay? To be absent from this body is a good thing. It's to be present with the Lord. I probably shouldn't say that, because as long as you're in it, God's got work for you. You've got a destiny. Um, Shepherd's Chapel, then. Uh, in, in the New Testament, is there a reference to what the Father wants uh, done to murderers? In the New Testament, yes, of course. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Christ said, I don't change one word of, of, the, um, of, the, of the law, not one word. Uh, it still affects. I, I, I did not, in, in um, Mary from Missouri, I got so wrapped up, I didn't answer a question about where it's seven times 70. It's Matthew chapter 18, verse 22. Now, back to this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, what it stipulates just before that, God said, I, I don't change one jot, not one tittle of the law. And what does the law say? The law says if somebody lies in wait and takes a life, kill him. But don't you feel bad about it. Let it be on my shoulders. Others will see, and these things will cease to happen among you. And we're not doing that. And, and it is biblical. But anyway, in that verse 20, let me do a little translating, and you can back me up by getting your strongs and you will see that I'm 100% accurate, okay? Or you could prove me wrong, if I am, but I'm not. It states very clearly there that thou shall not kill. Well, the word should be murder, because it is phonyons in the Greek tongue, which means criminal homicide, that you're in danger of perishing, and probably will. And then, in, of course, in the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15, a murderer cannot have salvation in the flesh. Why? Capital punishment is supposed to be practiced. Now, and of course, at the same time, you can't be a scripture lawyer. There are different reasons in taking a life. Sometimes it's a crime of passion that falls under a different set of laws than one that simply lies in wait because they're meaner than a snake, okay, just simply to kill to be killing. Okay, um, this would be Deborah from Florida. My son was killed three years ago in a car accident. I have been in constant torment. He knew Jesus, but I don't know if he was saved. If I don't know that he is in heaven soon, I just can't go on. Well, you can go right on, my dear, because he is in heaven. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. I want you to take that down. Find a little peace in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. To be abs absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Now, we are not to judge whether someone is saved or not. You do not know what went through that boy's mind in the last seconds. And nor, nor are we to. God is judge. Now, I can say this. As one of God's elect in the millennium, if he needs any help, you're going to be able to give it to him because in Ezekiel, this same book we're in, as I said, it has more about, um, about the millennium than any other book. It states in the 44th chapter that we can go help them if they need it, okay, and where they would take part in the second resurrection. But do not judge him. If he knew Jesus, he probably was saved. Sandy from Virginia, thank you for your prog program. You're welcome. Did Satan, ro does Satan roam the earth in his spiritual body? Can you be, ev can he be everywhere at once or does it, or does he give that power to the demons? Well, well it, Satan cannot roam the earth in his spiritual body, only his evil spirit. You know, God is very kind. He, for every negative, there is a positive, and that makes it a lot easier to understand God's Word. God has Christ at His right hand. Christ does not roam the earth, but His Holy Spirit does. And so it is with Satan. He's locked behind Christ in heaven, but His evil spirit, which is opposite of the Holy Spirit, can roam the earth to tempt whoever will allow it. 
But Christ loved us enough that before he left in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he gave us power over those spirits. It's where we don't put up with it. We send them back where they came from. They run from us. And if you're a strong Christian, that's exactly what they do. So there you have it. Leah from Texas, where in the Bible does it say what we can, can and cannot eat? Uh, Leviticus chapter 11 is probably a pretty good place that tells you both what you should and you should not eat. Uh, let me melt it down and simplify it for you. Don't eat scavengers. God placed scavengers on the earth to take care of disease, filth, and dead animals uh, that cleanse the earth. So don't eat them. It will make you sick. Eat only the animals that are not scavengers, basically. As I say, that's just a rough rule of the thumb. But he goes into much detail in Leviticus 11. Steve from Wisconsin. In the end times, I will send you leaders with minds of children. Please explain. Where do you find this in the Bible? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. It says in the end times, you're going to have leaders that are going to have the minds of children. Do you, you know where... We, we, have, we live in some very strange times. Do you know basically one of the reasons Germany lost World War II? One of the main reasons. They ran out of petrol. They had no oil. And would you believe that we have leaders today where petrol being without it, we're defenseless. Especially if you have to buy all your petrol from enemies that are a, of a totally different faith and want to kill us. Okay. And, and then you have leaders that will cut off our oil supply, put out moratoriums, and then on deep well, and then also put out not released uh, uh, contracts to build even, to drill shallow. And then for someone to mouth that we're safer than we ever were, we are in extreme danger. We have oil to let, but we have children making decisions in our government. Well, are you playing politics? No, I'm an American citizen. I've fought for this nation. I've shed blood for it. And being a military person, I know what makes nations strong, and it's not yakety, yakety, yakety. It's what it takes to be strong. And uh, let's see, what was it you asked? It's Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4, in the end times you're going to suffer children's minds as leaders. We're getting there. Bruce from Texas, please send me, and you're going to, I'm sure they did. What does born again mean? I believe it means when you are transformed into our spirit bodies. Well, I'm sorry, but you believe in wrong. It's just the opposite. It's when we are deferred or when we descend from our spiritual bodies into our flesh bodies in your mother's womb. It, I want you to take your strong concordance and check out the term in John 3, born again. The word is born from above. You must be born from above. Do, do you know why? Because in Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim, that's the fallen angels, refused to be born from above. They rather flew in from above and seduced the daughters of Adam. And this brought us a bunch of Geber giants, um, malefactors, whereby God had to bring in a flood to destroy the whole bunch of them. So, um, therefore, you must, to be saved, to, to, to please God, you must be born from above, of a mother's womb, and born innocent as a babe, and make your own mind up, not somebody else making your mind up, but you making your own mind up that you're going to stand for Christ and stand for something, or really you stand for nothing. So that's what it's all about, born from above, to do God's work right here on earth. You know, some of uh, God's elect have a destiny. Stick with it. You want to know where most of that destiny can be read real simple and short? Mark 13. 
false Christ is coming first, what are you going to do? The Bible tells you what you should do. That's a destiny. Mary from Georgia, thank you for teaching God's Word. You are so chapter by chapter. You're welcome. Please give me scripture on Mark in the forehead. Help me to explain it to others about it being in the mind, Revelation 9.4. Well, I would, I would recommend, I'm, I'm sure now that you don't have our tape, Mark of the Beast, which is yours for the asking. It's the only thing we give away free other than the newsletter here at the chapel. Otherwise, God's elect always pack their own part of the weight, all right? And there's a bunch of them. We appreciate them. But it goes into detail and gives you scripture on exactly what it means. Naturally, you are punished for not worshiping God, but worshiping Satan. They can mark you from head to toe with any number they want to put on you. It doesn't change your loyalty to Almighty God. So it's judged by what's in your forehead. Uh, Evelyn from Iowa. Uh, Pastor Murray, our son was telling us of a happening about mid-August that he saw on the Internet and said he also saw it in the news. We never saw it said it was a sun tsunami and picture of the Aurora Northern Lights. Well, it was beautiful and he was quite intrigued by it. Well, well it's true. We that, um, we that teach by satellite are really quite concerned about that tsunami from the sun because it does great damage to satellites and even to our electrical transmission lines here on Earth even, if it gets bad enough. And sunspots are not a good thing for transmitter, for uh, broadcasters. So we are quite concerned that we are in this span of time that that sun just violently uh, cast out and builds up uh, these eruptions. And um, we're in that season. And uh, it, it's, it was well noted, and there are pictures of this on the Internet that uh, if you want to see it, have your son clue you into it. Okay, uh, Mike from uh, Maryland. Question, when the elect are teaching in the millennium, what will the ones on the right side of the gulf be doing? Thank you. I hope I have it right. Well, you want to remember that a lot of those on the right side of the Gulf, God's putting together an army up there. Who do you think he's going to bring with him? It's not going to be the people on the wrong side of the Gulf. It's going to be the people on the right side of the Gulf coming down to join and to teach. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, you will all be priests with Christ 1,000 years. Well, what does a priest do? They teach. Well, who do they teach? Well, they don't teach a bunch of rocks. They teach the people that need to be taught. God only uses common sense, and he only uses people that have common sense, quite frankly. And um, they will be, and I'm, I'm not questioning your common sense. I'm just saying that's real easy to figure, okay? Uh, Joan from Oregon. As a mostly homebound senior, I'm trying to find a place in the Bible where it specifies our trying during the millennium to help guide and teach those on the wrong side of the Gulf who are still unsure about God and Jesus. Well, it, it's real easy. It's in this book of Ezekiel that we just started today, and we'll get to it in chapter 44. I think probably this is one of the, my most often asked questions. But you just go to Ezekiel chapter 44. As you see, from chapter 40 to the end, it's all about the millennium. In chapter 44, the Zadok in the Hebrew tongue means the elect, the just. Okay. They have special privileges. Why? They earned it. God is not a respecter of persons, but they earned it. So they are able to go to a relative, mother, brother, sister, unmarried father, uh, and help them. But then they have to stay away from Christ seven days if they do that for purification, which is no biggie. It's worth it to save the soul of a loved one. Ezekiel 44, begin reading with verse 20. And, you're, you know, being handicapped has nothing to do with what you be in your uh, spiritual body in the millennium. Deborah from Colorado. During today's teaching on Isaiah 53 and Hebrews 10, 
before communion, twice you made reference to the elect and the very elect. God being no respecter of persons, how do we differ in this way? We don't. It's just that God knows who he can count on and who he can't. Okay. He knows, uh, and does he expect a great deal from those that are weak? No, he doesn't. But those that do know better and that he has given gifts, he expects a, what he gives much, he expects much. But take the parable concerning the, the um, people, the talents, okay? He gave one person ten, he gave one just one, because he knew that's all they could handle. Okay? He, and five and ten got paid the same thing, though ten did a lot more. God is not a respecter of persons, but who he gives much, he expects much. No loafing around, no fooling around. I mean discipline. God's elect are disciplined to stay focused on the word of God. And that kind of separates who God can count on and who he can't. Okay. Uh, and, you, and you can't blame him. We're, we're coming up on some very serious times. And he can't depend on somebody that's off skylarking the other way when something needs to be done here in relationship to the false messiah. Cheryl from Tennessee, my question in regards to many that arose from the grave on the day of, of the crucifixion, Jesus, I always thought they actually came up from their, not, there they didn't, okay? Our, the, it would only seem that way to document that Christ had defeated death. To be absent from this body is present with the Lord, and guess what? I'm out of time, and I'm present with you, but going to be gone here in a second. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes His day when you read the letter that He sent to you. So when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. Talk about discipline. You listen good. You stay in His Word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.